Introducing Professor Pat Utomi, political economist, renowned professor and former Nigerian presidential aspirant. Professor Patrick Okedinachi Utomi, born on February 6, 1956 in Kaduna. Professor Utomi is a Nigerian professor of social and political economy, environment of business and entrepreneurship at the prestigious Lagos Business School. He is the founder of Center for Value in Leadership and the African Democratic Congress. He had earlier served in senior positions in government as special assistant to the President of Nigeria, late Alaji Shiaushagari, an advisor cum consultant to late Vice President Alex Ekweme. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Pat Utomi. Good evening, sir. Wow. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you so very much uh, for the Thank warmth you, of your welcome. It is a great pleasure and a privilege uh, to be able to join as Thank you, you so much, engage in this very important uh, 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 subject matter. I can tell you that when I think housing, I think mm. so many things. I think first and foremost mm. of the way that economies grow. When I think housing, I think of the way that people feel fulfillment and live their mm. aspiration as a result mm. of what they have um, managed to work at and produce in terms of housing. When I think housing, I think investments and how people store value. So to be able to join up so, mm. Uh, many today to discuss that subject is one that um, uh, excites me enormously. And I would like to mm. say that uh, people like you uh, deserve uh, a great deal of uh, compliment. Uh, you deserve the congratulations you, for the vision uh, to put Thank together uh, a summit of this nature so that people can focus their minds on something that is central to mm. how man essentially establishes his possibilities on this planet. Mm, um, thank you, sir. You know, I, I, you, you can't be um, more focused than to think about providing what is at one and the same time a basic need, one of the most mm. important basic needs mm. man does have is shelter. Mm. And that same basic need takes mm. you to a higher level of Fulfillment. So if Absolutely. you take a master hierarchy of needs, you yes, find sir. a structural nature mm. of housing to both fulfill mm. a basic need and provide mm. you fulfillment, the mm. ultimate. So mm. that's how uh, um, really uh, uh, extraordinary housing mm. is mm. as a factor in, in human. So mm. um, can I now proceed? Um, Speak to the Absolutely, presentation. Sir. All right. So I will uh, invite uh, the sharing of the screen uh, in in okay. um, looking at the subject uh, a matter so that I can just walk through uh, the territory that I I would like to cover in the presentation. All right. With speaking to the subject of affordable, accessible acceptable and accessible housing. Seems like a lot of things to desire at one time. Affordable, acceptable, and accessible. Now, a lot of people look at housing and what they see is not affordable. And when they see what is affordable, it's probably somewhere in the middle of some jungle, some forest, that it is clearly not um, uh, 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 acceptable uh, 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 and not accessible. But it is possible to find quality housing that is acceptable, that is accessible, and that is surely affordable. Uh, the idea of brainstorming on how to solve the problem of man's shelter need invariably will have to cover uh, this territory. And 
as we approach it, let us go to the very basic of housing, which is its affordability. Affordability because everyone needs housing. I am uh, frequently making jokes about um, how people leave the hierarchy of their needs um, with housing as my example. As we know, back in the 50s, uh, Abraham Maslow um, helped man to begin to understand motivation better by recognizing that men all have needs. And their needs are essentially um, on a hierarchy. At the very base of it are those needs of housing, shelter, food. And most people, you know, when they start out challenged, underprivileged, uh, the first thing they say, if I could just have some food, if I just have a roof over my head in one way or the other. And so my joke starts with uh, a person who comes out from the boondoggle somewhere. I, I don't want to name any state now. I, I typically would joke, make, mention one state somewhere in the South South and say the person takes off from that place coming to Lagos. His folk in Lagos have told him that Lagos is paradise on earth. So he's looking forward with great expectation. He comes on the back of uh, some 911 truck, hoping to get to Lagos and live the life. Every roundabout, somebody told him, you know, back in those days, uh, when my story started, was before the um, Lagos Ibadan Expressway. And so it, the traffic used to come to Lagos through Ikurudu. And there's, there was a big roundabout in Ikurudu where you turn. So any roundabout he sees, because they told him there's one big roundabout as you are approaching Lagos. And you're not about this is, he shouts, Lagos, Lagos. And then it would not be Lagos, maybe Shagamu roundabout. And then ultimately, he eventually gets to Lagos. And then he goes to uh, uh, somewhere uh, uh, um, off Ikurudu Road, where a cousin of his used to ride from many years ago. And uh, he goes to Fadi. And uh, he, you know, in Fadi, he asked for, after this is, cousin and he said such, no no such person lives here probably moved moved out about 10 years ago we don't know where he is so he has arrived in lagos he has no house nothing he ends up sleeping under a bridge and imagine that somebody comes to him while he's sleeping under the bridge and says to him look if you had a wish what would it be he says oh if i could find somewhere in a jigula that i could share with five people, one room, that would be tremendous progress. I mean, how I would, if God could only do that for me, and then you do him better, you say, okay, I'll give you one room just by yourself in Ajegunle. And he's very, very thrilled. He's very excited. When you meet him two years later, he's asking, look, those people who live in flats in Surulere, do they have five heads? Are they not human beings? Uh, that's the point about human needs never being searchable. And should he, uh, get lucky and move to Surulere. Very soon he begins to wonder if people who live in, in Victoria Land and Aikoi were not born of uh, women. So man aspires. And one of the anchors to his aspiration is housing. That's a uh, subject of our basic need. So in moving into this subject, we have to look at housing both as a basic need of shelter, the fact that it's a source of store of long-term value, the fact that it is a place where there's a regeneration of capital. The fact that this housing as a basic need that provides security, that's a fungible asset, enables us all to leave the mystery of capital and project our self-worth and pride. Now, we take on this subject, basic needs of shelter. Clearly. Um, if you do not have a roof over your head, you are likely to be challenged by many things. So most people would like a roof over their heads, but how do they assure this? Uh, typically, most people rent to start with. And in renting, they have a roof over their, their heads. But very often, it does not take into, the, into account the fact that uh, uh, somewhere down the line, the environment will not be amenable to being, you know, shaped any which way to make them 
um, you know, uh, more themselves because it is somebody else's. So renting has its value to give you that original basic need for shelter, but you want to own yours so that you can uh, do with it as you please and get more out of it. Uh, besides, as you keep paying rent, um, you are losing what could have been inputted into long-term value. If you had a mortgage and what you paid as rent was paid as mortgage, it is adding up to what will become your own house. And so uh, there's need to rethink that basic shelter uh, essence of housing. Now, we have also found um, in economic perceptions of how nations grow rich that many economies grow essentially based on the fact that people can have um, property that they can remortgage and use to raise capital to start a business. So a house can be the very basis for your growing your financial possibilities because uh, it's a source of um, capital. It is a literally a fungible asset that can be converted into capital. But what we find, of course, is that in some societies, in some countries, it's a lot easier to transform property that you have into capital than in others. There is a, a Peruvian economist called Hernando de Soto, who is particularly famous for a small book that he wrote years ago. Got a lot of commendation from uh, people on the right, capitalists. Margaret Thatcher was one of the great lovers of the book. Uh, basically, Hernando de Soto, who has been to Nigeria a couple of times, he spoke at Ingbeti uh, here in Lagos, the Lagos Economic Summit many years ago. And uh, on two other occasions that I know of, that uh, he came to Nigeria, uh, besides the Ingbeti one. Uh, but the Soto essentially argues that the difference between the rich West and the poor rest of us is uh, the fact that in Africa, for example, we all have assets. But our assets constitute what he calls dead capital because we cannot translate it into, say, collateral for a, a, a loan that you can then use to start a business. And many of us have houses that have no C of O. Because it has no C of O, we can use that house for uh, much more than just sleeping it. But in the West, literally every piece of land, every house has value, which is in a registry known and can be traded. This ease of trade of that value is essentially what makes it easy for him to leverage it to get cash to start a business. This is what uh, he talks about in when he talks about representational systems, land registry, and all of that. Converts your assets into capital. Whereas in poor countries like Nigeria, where these representational systems are not uh, significantly uh, developed, uh, people have assets, but these assets constitute dead capital. So we don't grow business fast enough or big enough because most of our capital, which is dead, cannot lead to regeneration. That fungibility, that asset of capital uh, is, is lost to um, our assets. So uh, we also know that this whole terrain is a very important one because it is one of the easiest ways for transgenerational gifting to transfer value from one generation to another. Um, the Queen of England, the royal family, the Windsors, are such wealthy people, not so much because they are great producers of any wealth, but because they have huge landed assets. If you own a good part of Mayfair, the rents that you extract for owning Mayfair will make you a very rich person from generation to generation. So um, clearly, um, housing is a major source of transgenerational gifting. 
And then, of course, it constitutes a major part of your national capital stock. Um, I often say to uh, uh, um, economic development people that one of the tragedies of our development experience compared, for example, to that of Singapore is that uh, the concept of forced savings, which is what is mobilized for investments and growth, uh, always there, uh, was a, a, a brilliantly, brilliantly uh, played by people of Singapore uh, through the housing fund, which was set up uh, by the uh, Housing Development Board of Singapore. It takes a lot of credit for Singapore's ascendancy uh, as an economy. Unfortunately for us, we have not been able to do likewise, even though we had our own housing fund and all of that. We have not managed the process well enough to get the kind of bounce on capital as Singapore has managed to get out of the um, stock of the Housing Development Board. So we're challenged in making the point that real estate matters uh, in saying that it is important for us to review and reflect on these critical parameters of housing and real estate in general in order to boost our individual um, uh, self-worth and drive growth of our economies. Uh, I often say that when I was a young graduate student in the United States in the late 70s, I never stopped to be fascinated by the fact that uh, the leading news broadcast in America in, the, in those days was the CBS Evening News. It was anchored by uh, a gentleman called Walter Cronkite. And Walter Cronkite was often referred to as the most trusted man in America. And every evening, two things ended his news broadcast. He would say, that's the way it is, 21st January, 1978. Uh, but the other thing that went with the closing of every broadcast was housing starts. They will, the, the news will run a click on the number of housing units that were started in the United States uh, that particular day. So that's how important housing is for economic development. Indeed, it played a fundamental role in the emergence of the middle class as we know it today. And if we just move on uh, to the next um, uh, uh, slide, you know, how the world got to become a middle class world. And there are many stories that are tell, told about how uh, American middle class emerged. But one of the uh, uh, best, in my view, was told by a Harvard professor called Ted Lowe. Uh, Dick Ted Lowe, uh, in um, his book, The Giants of Enterprise, uh, essentially tells the story of um, Henry Ford and the moving assembly line. And how, of course, as we all know, capital following the Industrial Revolution was um, not so friendly to the working class. Workers lived miserable lives. Um, Charles Dickens in England, his famous novels were about the misery of the industrial workers in the heart of that Industrial Revolution. And um, the next huge leap after the design of the steam engine or redesign of the steam engine by James Watts, which drove the Industrial Revolution, the next great leap was actually the moving assembly line. And who was at the heart of the moving assembly line but Henry Ford? Uh, Henry Ford changed the course of history in many ways because, like the typical capitalist of his time, he was nasty to labor at first. Uh, until it occurred to him, uh, wait a minute, how come people who are producing these Model T Fords cannot afford to own one? And his response to it was a dramatic increase in salaries. That increase in salaries, uh, some give credit for stimulating the middle class as we know it today. But the other thing that is giving much credit for this is the fact that as World War II was nearing a close, and uh, the uh, governments 
of that era in America wanted a boost uh, to the people. The, one of the ideas was to create a housing agency uh, that came to be known as Fannie Mae. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac would be twin organizations that would shape the growth of housing in America. And this is captured significantly in their uh, corporate essence. Uh, Fannie Mae had as his big, hairy, audacious goal to democratize home ownership. Huh? Why are you here? They will say to democratize home ownership. So a person who is able to own, uh, to, to vote, should be able to own a home. That was the major logic of Fannie Mae. And this had transforming consequence on housing starts and the growth of the American economy after World War II. So um, it is critical in this understanding that um, we be able to uh, um, learn from the American experience in traveling that track. So after the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac driven expansion of the American economy, um, there was excess, of course, that loomed many years down the line, as we now know. Uh, the global financial crisis of 2008 was essentially the result of the subprime crisis that came out of how uh, bankers played the um, housing or mortgage uh, values that existed. Uh, because property values kept going up, people were sold a uh, uh, property that they could not really afford in the quote-unquote understanding that they would grow into uh, that uh, uh, the property values would make up for they are not having the income to drive a mortgage. Uh, that basic lie which allowed the um, the uh, um, uh, consultants or, sorry, the bankers to end a lot of um, bonuses would eventually become a, a fundamental challenge uh, for the um, uh, people who bought those uh, uh, mortgages. Uh, because risks could be packaged and sold globally, American uh, realtors sold their risks in packages around the world, uh, which is why the speed of contagion, when the bubble burst on those products, was global. Uh, many people around the world held uh, packages of American mortgage uh, uh, um, uh, products that really uh, came unraveling. But there is no doubt that mortgage remains a critical source of value and of sharing this uh, uh, value, storing it and transmitting it. So. Uh, what are the challenges that we have had to deal with as investment with real estate? How is it affected by the times that we live in with COVID-19 uh, creating uh, new kinds of circumstances uh, for us? Um, well, we experienced the fractured supply chains and increased costs that were driven by that inputs for housing development in a country like Nigeria that did not manufacture most of its inputs had to go up. Uh, but it only creates a new opportunity for us to say, how do we create value chains that will enable us to be competitive in producing inputs for the kinds of things we need as much as we need housing? Uh, there are numbers that have been flying back and forth about the housing deficit situation in Nigeria. Some will tell you that it's a 17 million uh, housing units deputy. Some will say 19 million. I've had um, conversations with uh, uh, Mr. Batunde Raji Fashola, who is the minister responsible. He has a completely different view. He thinks that these are exaggerated, and he gives reasons why he thinks they're exaggerated. 
But the truth is, whether they're exaggerated or not exaggerated, the uh, truth is that we have uh, millions of housing unit gaps, and these need to be filled. And this constitutes an opportunity. This constitutes uh, 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 not just opportunity for, for investment, but opportunity for growth of the economy, uh, opportunity uh, uh, for uh, 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 business in various aspects of the, the value chain, because there are so many things that go into a house, whether it is the cement business or the wood business or the metal business or the glass business or the you can go on and on and on uh the 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 very many constituents of a housing unit and how that can be produced and produced cheaply enough to be affordable to be uh, accessible and to uh, therefore uh, become the uh, essential basis for the, uh, if you will, fulfillment of the people in the economy. So let's move more quickly now. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry I didn't ask how much time I had to speak for. So if I'm left alone, I might go for the next hour, but I think I should probably now find out how much time I have so I can check myself. Um, is there any chance I can, I can be told how much time I have? Well, let me then quickly turn to institutions and creative investments. Um, All right, sir. You, you have you have fifteen minutes more for your for your okay, speech, and then we still want to take a ten ten minutes ten minutes question. Um, ten minutes question. I ask, okay. Uh, yes. All right, lovely. So I'll speak to the issue of institutions and creative investment very quickly. I have talked already about property rights. Uh, in talking about Hernan de Soto. Uh, there are issues of new products, creative packages that can bring people into investing in the housing space. There's so many ways, especially with fintech. Um, I, I spoke recently somewhere about um, uh, how the use of mobile telephony uh, allowed Africa to leapfrog in some areas. Um, and Pesa in uh, uh, um, Nairobi or Kenya. Uh, 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 and how mobile money grew there. We can use that technology to do a lot of things, to have savings uh, uh, for mortgage and so on and so forth. The point is that there are so many products that can come up as a result of uh, these uh, developments. Um, blockchain technology and artificial intelligence and other things that are flowing out of uh, uh, the fourth industrial revolution uh, uh, products are also opportunities to create uh, different kinds of uh, products and services in the mortgage field that can increase opportunities uh, for all. I think also that if we bear all of this in mind and then approach the big question of how affordable housing <clears throat> has been treated, <clears throat> I think we'll find that <clears throat> One of the benefits of World War II was that it forced many of the societies of the West to look at the well-being of their people and how affordable housing was part of that. In the American, on the American side, uh, the role that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac played, I have mentioned and talked about. But social housing was very big <clears throat> in the United Kingdom. Indeed, the rise of Fabian socialism, uh, and that's a long story that I don't have the time to go through, but I love the story of how the Fabians uh, began to group and actually founded the university, London School of Economics, which then became a very uh, veritable um, uh, source of uh, policy advocacy and all of that, um, eventually then led to a labor government and one of the major things they did was social housing. So right in the middle of London, they built many affordable housing projects, quite a number of them in very key locations close to prime areas. And it enabled affordable housing to be accessible. And this changed a lot in the UK. Of course, in later years, there have been all kinds of arguments about 
how that has developed and uh, uh, they have tried to uh, do some gentrification of some of those uh, areas. Uh, but the impetus of that, I think, was, was uh, very, very uh, helpful. Uh, at the local level, we have also seen affordable um, and accessible housing develop as a result of many factors. Uh, as a young man growing up in Lagos when a cool bridge was built in the 60s, during the Civil War, actually, and um, I was a little Larry boy. I grew up around the Adiro uh, area in the 60s. Uh, that area used to be an, an extremely exclusive area. In fact, it was so exclusive that we could not get a bus. Buses didn't come into Adiro the, the The world ended around Body Thomas. So all this Eric Moore area was just bush uh, at the time. And like I said, the uh, Adiro Gunsoya area was upper middle class uh, uh, housing uh, uh, as such. And if we as kids needed to get on a bus, we had to walk our way all the way to Western Avenue to Alaka to get on a bus. Uh, but what happened when they started building a, a co bridge, they needed to relocate people who lived in the Saleko area that had to go down to build a co bridge. And they built social housing around that neighborhood. It became the Shita area, where I think those called them Udile Goguru because they were tall buildings, so to speak. They were how many stories? Four or so stories high. But it gave people who lived in what may be called blighted neighborhoods an opportunity to come into a fairly affordable uh, um, housing in what would be prime neighborhoods. Uh, and we saw that happen in other places. I've given a more rural example with the uh, uh, LNG project in Boni and the housing development there. Of course, we saw several other such projects driven by government. Indeed, the government in which I served, the government of Alaji Shehu Shagari, uh, made housing one of its cardinal projects. Uh, and so it went around the country taking areas of land uh, that were accessible, generally speaking, and to be opened up and build houses in those places. However, because of politics, in some states that were in opposition, the state governments refused to give the federal government land in um, prime areas, so they had to go way into the bush to build those houses. At that time, they seemed like uh, totally unaccessible and all of that. The amazing thing about development is many of those places have become center of town today. And this is part of the, the story. Uh, of course, what has happened with some of those houses, for example, the, in Lagos, uh, the, the, the Jack on the administration was very aggressive in trying to put up social housing in the middle of town, the Ikmori area in Surulere and several such places around town. Um, but what, what we see is that many of those areas uh, need to be revisited. So there's a new housing opportunity in a form of, not the pejorative sense, gentrification. That there are possibilities that uh, those kinds of neighborhoods that seem sort of inappropriate where they are located can start new real estate investment to um, rebuild or remodel some of those houses, upgrade them, give them more value, uh, for those who own those places and, and uh, run. The Akirile area, which was, for example, is really part of that um, process of um, low cost housing in, in between middle class areas with those bungalows. They were very cheap, one room apartments in those days. Uh, today, they should be redeveloped, many of them, because they are prime locations. They don't have, you don't have to chase away the people who live there today, as tends to be the case, but you could, uh, in gentrification, uh, provide an opportunity to have greater income uh, if they choose then to move elsewhere and rent that out as their uh, business, but you could raise the quality of the housing in a, you know, while, I mean, keeping things affordable, uh, sort of. Okay, so bearing this in mind, 
I would like to say that the key is housing available to all. Housing that is affordable and one that everybody can be proud to own and live a retirement that uh, they can look back on and say, we worked hard and we had something to show for our life's work in the quality of the place of abode that we have and which they can ultimately then pass on to the next generation what started for them as affordable, acceptable, and accessible housing becoming a great gift across generations. Dear friends, very distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that the infinite possibilities of the human spirit can be found in how creativity in housing can help us change the lives of people, both as potential um, owners of transforming uh, a value stock and as people who can live in greater comfort escaping uh, what uh, the Princeton economist uh, 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 um, Angus Deaton uh, would call the great escape the miseries of life from education and healthcare into places where they can live with the satisfaction that their lives work has given them. I want to thank you very much for your kind attention, and I'll be very pleased to entertain uh, questions. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so, so much. Um, we're going to be taking a few questions. I'm sure um, there are loads of questions already in the chat room, um, so I'm expecting the media director to put them up so we can take them one after the other as much as we can take within the time available so thank you so much once again prof deeply appreciate this this opportunity honestly and um i know we're still going to have a lot more and that will be more enclosed we, we still need to have an enclosure, especially for developers uh, because there's quite a lot that government should do but for whatever reasons i don't think the priorities are right on the part of the that, government but we that, can't that, that's a very working. important area actually yeah. that you already have raised as a question um um one of the big challenges we have is that we over assume about mm -hmm. what government knows mm -hmm. and how government should act it mm -hmm. is our business as stakeholders mm -hmm. to shape how government acts mm -hmm. and organizing mm -hmm. ourselves to be able to do that is a critical part of the way forward uh you know, mm. in, in, in 1985, um, there was a conference in Nairobi uh, that the Aga Khan Foundation sponsored that was designed to enable or facilitate a tripartite approach to development where government, mm. the private sector, and mm. the so-called NGOs or uh, PDAs, mm. as they were called back in those days, private development agencies, mm in mm. partnership determined how policy will be shaped mm. to advance the common good of all. Uh, that resulted in the founding of the Enabling Environment mm. Forum in Nigeria. And the Enabling Environment Forum eventually became the Nigerian Economic Summit Group. But I don't mm. think that our organizing of that has gone as well as should. And so we need mm. uh, uh, clusters of players uh, like you to look at an area. For example, we don't have a mortgage industry in Nigeria. Uh, a mm. couple of years ago, uh, um, a, 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 and I know the IFC has done a big study. Everybody mm. keeps studying and studying and nothing really happens. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I was helping somebody get a mortgage from mm. First Bank, actually. I can go as far as mention the name. And because I had access to the managing director, I was able to help. And then I lent to my chagrin mm. that that was one of less than 38,000 active mortgages in the entire country of 200 million people. If there's anything that encourages corruption in the country, it is that. Mm, mm. that. I mean, everybody wants to own a mm. home and there are only 38,000 mm. active mortgages in the country. Where did the rest of the people get all the mm. money they're using? They're either stealing it, taking bribes, or mm. building mm. one more at a time. You know? So if we want to really build mm. this economy, we've got to find a creative way mm of building a mortgage industry. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Another question here from Jonathan Anaja Mataya says, 
He said, I have a question. The average annual rent in Nigeria is quite less than average annual mortgage payment. How is it, how easy then will it be to convert one's annual rent into a mortgage? Mm -hmm. Well, you see, the fact that um, you are going to own the house is, is more mm -hmm. value. So mm. of necessity, if you paid more mortgage, you shouldn't really see it as a problem. Mm. However, it should be structured such that it doesn't kill you. It must, you need to eat and do mm. other things. Uh, mm. You know, the, you can't be living for the house. Um, <laughs> I, I think that because the mortgages are very short in their tenure, mm. and part of the reason is because we don't have a housing market. When I say housing market, mm. I mean the sense that you can easily sell it. You see, yeah. the, of course, the joke in America is that the average American is what? One paycheck away from homelessness. Mm. Uh, because if you don't earn a pay one month, two, three months, mm. you can't uh, pay your mortgage and they yeah. repossess the house. And you are homeless, typically. typically. Yeah. Uh, so mm. uh, people are struggling not to lose their jobs because they don't want to you know, lose paying their mortgage. Mm. But the mortgage is a very long one. Mm. So the, the, mm. the rent does not have to be so much lower than the mortgage mm. uh, uh, because the mortgage is a long mortgage, mm. a 30 year mortgage, whatever, whatever. Uh, but in Nigeria, because the mortgage is so short, seven years, you know, sometimes two years or whatever, uh, the mm. rent is obviously much, much lower. So mm. that's really what the challenge uh, uh, is there. We need to, uh, 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 if the market were such that you can easily take the person's house if he didn't pay mortgage for three months. Then you can sell it immediately mm. to another person, and so you will not have that problem. Mm. 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 Sorry, wow. I'm, I'm trying to read the next. Um, yeah. So, uh, Odeyemi Oladele, mm. yes, Odeyemi Oladele is saying, is there any alternative either product that can still mix in replacement of cement? That question is not quite clear. Yeah, okay, no, I get the question actually. Uh, you know, part of the I cost of housing. You get that. Okay. Yeah, okay. I can see part of the cost of a uh, problem of the cost of housing, okay. which is affecting our housing stock, is the limitation to the kinds mm -hmm. of products that we use to construct homes. Uh, Nigeria here is mainly cement, big, big cement. Whereas there are products elsewhere that you can have styrofoam in between setting panels and it's stronger than cement mm. even and much cheaper mm. and all of that. Mm. So we have mm. not had enough creativity in uh, in the mix. Most typical American homes, the separations mm. inside are dry walls. <laughs> and they're very, you know, here yeah. everything is boom, 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 cement. And, and yeah. so it builds <laughs> up to much, much bigger costs. So I think that developers need mm. to become more, more creative. Even homeowners need to become less, mm. or as the word, condescending at products other than cement. It's a cultural thing. Mm. We're used to cement as it. So mm. when you see a mm. drywall separating uh, rooms and stuff like that, you go, ah, this is not quality housing. Whereas you could significantly reduce the cost of the housing yeah. unit by going to alternative mm. uh, uh, products. Mm. Mm. Interesting. I'll, I'll take this as my last, as our last question um, before we before we allow you go, sir. Um, Akinshola Olumide is asking a question. He said a profound privilege to listen to Professor Patu told me. He said his question is, why isn't there a good synergy between government and real estate companies for food out in their states? And then maybe I should add that what can, can be done to improve that. Yeah. Um, it is not peculiar to the real estate business. It's almost every aspect of enterprise. <laughs> and it is because mm -hmm. of a certain development. You see, um, if I go into the philosophy of how government evolved, that would take us a mm -hmm. very long time. So I don't maybe not go <laughs> into that. But you see, yeah, in Europe, eh, Government evolved out of rich people trying to create a platform for mm. adjudicating their interests. They already made money. Mm. 
in Nigeria, mm -hmm. colonials who created this thing were about to leave and they just found some people and say, okay, mm -hmm. you okay, take over. So those people then started using that to make money. So mm -hmm. it was not the other way around. So governments mm -hmm. then began to look down at business and the rest of society. These individuals who became government, so to speak, and they were now the masters. <laughs> rather than what was created mm. to service the interest of these rich people in Europe who had already mm. made their money. Mm. So mm. you then find that mm. government is consistently, pardon my English here or my French, uh, a nuisance. <laughs> uh, mm. um, rather than being an aid, a facilitator, because those mm. there are trying to use that authority to extract rent from the system. Uh, mm. The biggest risk of doing business in Nigeria is regulatory risk, is the role of government. Mm. Mm. So how do we manage this? It will take consistent engagement. And this is why things like Nigerian Economic Summit Group and Co. were created. You have to be active and have an association. Mm. Mm. Um, what we need in Nigeria are strong institutions. Mm. Government, our institutions are very weak. Mm. <clears throat> and one of the best um, conversations around high institutions Image mm. was offered mm. in 1990 by economists who won a Nobel Prize in economics called um, uh, um, uh, Douglas North. Uh, in fact, in the 1990 book Institutions, Institutional Change and uh, Economic Performance, uh, Dougie North makes the argument that institutions evolve from the engagement of interested parties mm. at first you want advantage to yourself but when you struggle to get advantage then you find tomorrow that your friend is the one whose friends are in government and you are the losing mm. side and things change mm. again mm. and all of you come and agree <laughs> okay please it's better to have a level playing field so it doesn't matter whether it's your friend or my friend in government mm. these boundaries mm. should always be there mm. that's what an institution mm. is that's what mm. ultimately leads to economic advance in Nigeria, mm. our institutions have been very weak. We have not built them up there. And the only way we can build them up is for active players, like all of you in the mortgage business, mm. to say, look, oh, no, we mm. must agree to some basic rules. And then to pressure the system mm. to respect and recognize those boundaries. Mm. That's how we'll manage to get that mm. to happen. Wow. So this is, this is, this is worth more than a million dollars. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, um, thank you so much for, I, I know if we dedicated two hours for you alone, I'm sure it's not sufficient to deal with some areas you would love to go into, but sincerely, I do not take this opportunity for granted. I deeply and deeply appreciate it. On behalf of our entire company, Life Faith Group, um, the, the millennials you see there, I think I shared a bit about that with you. Uh, this, this, this is a Life Faith company as well, and we are on a mission we're going to save to providing 1 million homes. And that's why we're pushing this out, also, not just to educate um, um, the market, but also to also enlighten some of our colleagues within the industry and see how we can together. This is not this is no one man's job. Um, we, we need synergy. We need collaboration to be able to make this happen and then turn things around. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, honestly, I deeply, deeply appreciate your being part of this conference. I deeply, deeply appreciate it. Thank you so much, sir. It's a great pleasure. Thank you. I wish you the best. Yeah.